adults, you have no one to raise your youth. You gave me a million dollars and said you can only apply it to one or apply it to my 27 year old. Because she then will be empowered to take care of her young brother. Mm. I empower it to my young person, he's three. There could be a tragedy where he loses life in 10 years and never done anything with him. At his cognitive level of development, he would not be able to assist you. My older daughter could literally put together, she works at Emory University for a health institute. She would be able to immediately hire young people, train those young people, go out to the community and begin to transform our lives. So we have to move away from this notion of thinking to help children means we have to necessarily directly spend our youth, our resources on them. If the people taking care of the youth are broke, the youth are broke. Mm. So I recommend that we begin to focus more of our attention on our 20 and 30 and 40, 50 and 60 and 70, 80 year olds. So this way our youth have foundations, plural, not singular insofar as institutions for them, usually that they will access later. And the last thing I want to do is, uh, I want to give you a frame of African American political thought that I'm using for this lecture. It comes primarily from two African American scholars, Adolph Reed uh, and Martin Kilson, developed in uh, one in 71, and then uh, Reed sort of revised it uh, in the early 83. Uh, four basic concepts. One is assimilation. They define it as the adoption of dominant culture in the melting pot theory, the preference for the national identity over the racial one. So this happens when you ask an African American about their heritage, they start telling you about Native Americans that they know nothing about. They start telling you how they're not black, how they're American. Second one is integration, the acceptance of racial differences, but the demanding of free access to political, social, and economic rights within the exact existing organizational structures. So that means that in order for us to uh, identify authority, we start talking about the Constitution, a document written by slave owners. We start talking about the law, as important and as valuable as that is, with all the limitations that that brings. Third one is black power. Brokered access to black political, economic, and social channels with an emphasis on race consciousness. There's far more things that can be added to that, particularly if you study Amos Wilson um, and some of our other scholars and Angela Davis. But lastly, they give four variations of black nationalism. The first one is cultural nationalism. The reification of thing African and African American through the emphasis on cultural artifacts, such as the drumming we just heard. Now keep in mind, tomorrow is Sunday. I was sharing with Brother Neil as we were listening to drumming outside. Imagine if every church service tomorrow began with that drumming. Not the organ, not the pianos. On the one hand, that would be the existence of an African consciousness. I suspect it's absence from those churches. Simultaneously, that does not mean that after the music stopped, that they would treat themselves or our people any better than those with the organs. I've seen many people wearing daishikis and speaking African languages and African drumming who will cut your throat, mistreat you, ignore you, not respond to your human needs. And I've seen many people using the term Negro who will love you and lift you up. So while these things are important, it's also important not to make a fetish of them. The second one is revolutionary nationalism. Major systemic changes in the American social order, usually with some variation of Marxist ideology. Third, separation, separatism. Isolation of races, either by partition of the United States territory or by mass immigration of Africans out of the United States, which is a combination of all of these, a combination particularly of certain elements of Garveyism. And the last one, Pan-Africanism, a radical change in the world's social order, emphasizing the interests of the people of African descent, generally accomplished by Afrocentric ideology or Marxist ideology. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about this here. I'm going to, I did something I, I'm trying to get into the habit of doing now to write out my lectures. And so I went to the library this morning. I was going to show you the lectures, as you'll see. Um, it is seven pages, so I'll skip over some of it. Um, now, I wrote these seven pages literally in 90 minutes. There's a little bit more typos than I want to show you. <laughs> so I'm going to read off my printed copy. Um, but as I told my mother on the way over here, 
That 90 minutes is not so much my brilliance, but just my background and knowledge of art. You to change the subject, I might need a week to make a presentation. So each of us have a kind of knowledge base of what we're knowledgeable or uh, Sister Myers, what is your area of, of, of intellectual expertise? Um, <clears throat> my interest is in um, human development from an African-centered perspective. Right. So if you ask me to write that piece, that's a week's worth of work. That's not 90 minutes for me, but then Sister Myers produces in 90 minutes or so. So each of us have a gift of what we're knowledgeable about. Well, coming in here, I heard Brother Neil tell this young man he's a historian of basketball here in Columbus, and he rattled off a whole bunch of facts and new interpretations and understanding. So each of you whose names I don't know, we all have something that we are gifted and knowledgeable in. So when I say it was in 90 minutes, it's not a tribute to uh, me, it's just a tribute to what I've been studying over the past 20, 30 years. I want to make seven concrete suggestions of what we could do to incorporate Garveyism in the city of Columbus. There's no sense in talking about change in the country and you can't change your neighborhood. Mm. Suggestion number one. Buy and rehab two adjacent homes on Cleveland Avenue between 11th Avenue and Hudson. Buy two homes. Well, let me begin by, by putting it and showing you this part because this is the key part. Marcus Garvey Leadership Plan for Columbus, Ohio. The black community create and self-fund. We don't self-fund it, but we can all just, I can stop talking, get those drums back up, we can all leave now. No one's gonna pay for your freedom. Never. They paid to enslave you. They benefit by your disorganization. They're not going to pay you. So as you refuse, or when you refuse to use your own resources, would someone please pull out a cell phone? <coughs> the mini god of today's culture. Everybody got one. Please go to your calculator. It's a project I had my students at OSU do in 2012 and 2014. When your calculator, would you put the number 100 times 80,000? 8 million. How much is that? 8 million. 8 million. 8 million? Times 12? Times 12, oh, no, no. that'll be... What is it? 96. 96 million. 96, 96, 96 million. million? Yes. Times 4. Times 4. 284 million. That's what black Americans spend. That's what black Americans spend on cable in four years. What? The average cable bill, we physically call the cable stations. And you know it's true anyway because you pay your bill. The average cable bill was a little slightly over 100, and we narrowed it down. We did the demographic research to so there's roughly 80,000 separate African American homes paying. The same people who own nothing pay the same people oppressing them. In a four year period, it takes to graduate from high school over a quarter of a billion dollars to watch TV. And Michael Jackson's song is pertinent. I'm talking about the man in the mirror. And I'm asking them to make that change if they want to be free. So the fact that you have money, you can't deny. And if you do deny it, they have to pay stuff to prove you're lying. Right. Any group of people who will spend $400 million watching TV in four years when they're not represented on that TV, and when there are, they're stereotyped, and they will not be hired by that TV station, are people who are culturally backwards in the 21st century. Mm. So, like, so the part that we need to know is why are people... The part, well, we know why the people are part. What we need to know is how we can change it. And since we can't change those 80,000, everybody in this room can change themselves. So, the, so when I say self-fund, that means, by the example I just gave you, remember, we're only talking about Columbus. So I also have my students in that same four-year period. So remember that 300, what was that, 84, how much was that? 384 Yeah. And then we did times two for the I-71 of Columbus and Cincinnati that we had over black people spending a four-year period, $1 billion watching TV. We didn't include Lima, Toledo, Sandusky, Mansfield, Youngstown. We didn't go to Tennessee and Atlanta. That's four years on I-71, a billion dollars watching TV. 
So when we say sell fun, we mean just digging in your pocket, the same exact one you dig in for cable. Right. And I use cable because if I use the internet, people will say I need the internet. No one can argue they need cable. Right. And we often do need the internet for a variety of sources. Now, no one needs cable. So since we have the money for cable, we have the money to buy two houses on Cleveland, really a whole block, by Cleveland Avenue. So what would we do if we bought Cleveland Avenue? We would develop the Marcus Garvey Leadership Center. The homes of function as a center for adult and youth leadership development, especially in the areas of politics, international affairs, economics, and education. The center would be grounded in Pan-African principles of Marcus Garvey, and often and also great African, Pan-African thinkers and other traditions. The Marcus Garvey Center would provide the community a monthly lecture series. Developing community solutions, literary events, art activities, and exhibits. It'll be a house of hospitality for Africans arriving in the USA, visiting dignitaries, and others from other countries, cities, and counties. Right there, down the street that we just drove by, where it doesn't currently exist. See, many times I've interacted with Pan African people. They have a way of cussing out subtly and sometimes overtly black people who go to church. And they call Negroes if we don't share their Pan African perspectives. But I always like to remind them that those black people have buildings. Yes, they do. That they pay for. Yes, they for do. What they believe in. Yes, they do. And then when I come to the Pan African community, I'm There's looking nothing. for a building. <laughs> nothing. We're not in a building right now for the Pan African people. We're in the building of an institution downtown that we've helped fund, but we're not the only ones there. I was thinking of 65,000 students, 4,000 of them look like us. There are more Chinese students from the country of China than African-American students in 50 states down the street. In this country, we have 45 million in this country. So when we start talking about things that we can do, we as a people have got to begin to think different. So for example, we have over 100 black colleges, half of them are totally useless, half of them which are dysfunctional. But they have land. So I'm only going to talk about the private schools where they're not state entities, and tomorrow, what could they do? Well, let's see. Howard University, one of the more functional ones, still dependent upon state and federal funds. What might they do? Somebody grab your cell phone again. 45,000 times 5, 45,000 times 5,000. 45,000 times 5,000. What do we have? That's how much your Ohio State gets from those 45,000, from those 5,000 Chinese students every year. Repeat that. 5,000 students just from China. And by the way, I read a position paper. They had 160 Chinese students 10 years ago. They came up with a plan to strategically increase their Chinese students. They had 5,000 a day. Each of them paid an average of 45,000. That's nearly a quarter of a billion dollars per calendar year in those four years. That's over $800 million the Ohio State have gotten from students from China who are not eligible for financial aid. $800 million. So what does that tell me Howard could do? It tells me Howard could go to a university, say, like Alcorn State, Michigan, excuse me, in Mississippi, and say, listen, we want to buy Alcorn State. We're going to turn this into an international hub, and we're going to Asia and China, and we're going to make this a school just for them. We're going to get that $45,000 million and compete with Ohio State. We're going to bring students in from Africa, students from, Air, from Asia, students from Latin America, the Caribbean island. There's federal rules of what they can do, and federal limits of what they can pay and what they have access to. African Americans are accused. I say accused, you might think of it differently. Of being a very creative people, I happen to not share that perspective. I go by my left eye and my right eye. And the people with the potential that we have in our ways, our communities, look, I don't ascribe the term creativity to. I happen to have a very different position, for example, on the greatness of our music. I happen to believe that we are saturated. You know, this bottle of water helps sustain us. If it was as much as this room, it would kill us. And that's what music is like. It'll sustain you unless you have too much of it. 
And so people who in the 21st century should be dependent on science like they do for those cell phones that they've made of God can't produce them. How can a group of people 45 million deep not have one car factory in their own country that they've been in for 400 years? And how can they have no shame about it? How can we not be ashamed that we don't produce one single car on the planet? No shame. Malcolm X said, stop singing, start swinging. I challenge each of you to go to our public libraries and do nothing but take a seat and watch the behavior of our children. The ones you gave birth to, the ones you raised, the one who's sleeping right now and you're talking about something important. I challenge you to go watch their behavior. The world is looking at it even when you refuse to acknowledge what you see. I challenge you to go to the library and watch how they function day to day. You would never know they have the lowest ATC scores. You would never know they have the lowest writing skills. You would never know they have the lowest critical reading skills watching what they do. And I'm not talking about young people up there because I've been there every day. I was there this morning, 9 a.m. to 12. They're not cursing. They're not fighting. They're not doing anything wrong. They're just off task to the needs of their academic development off task to the needs of their people. My mother will attest to you when I was in high school, I was in the ninth grade, I was in the 10th grade, I was in the 10th grade, and I was in the 10th grade. <laughs> my mother will attest to you that when in high school, when I finished high school, my GPA was 0 0.50. Every class I begin, I pass out my transcript. But then I ask them to sort of turn it over. And then they turn it over and they look at my transcript from college and it suddenly says 3.98 and they say to me well mr cash what happened so well first of all the 0 0.50 is misleading grades are phony and not a measurement of learning they're usually there because teachers and the institutional infrastructure finds it easier to put an a on a sheet of paper instead of tell you something about what you learned and how often when we talk to students do we say what did you learn we say, how did you do? They say, hey, we say, good job, and that's the end of that conversation. Mm -hmm. We don't say, well, did you learn anything that would transform your life and your communities and your families? Did you learn anything that would improve your health and your economic world development? We just say, how did you do in school? And they give us a proverbial answer, A, B, or whatever that might be. Because you see, when I was in high school getting what they call poor grades, I was reading 150 books a year. From the time I was 16, there has not been a year since I was 16 that I've not read 150 books per year. And what I understood at a young age was that if the slave owner would kill you for reading this, there must be a power there. If they want to keep me illiterate, semi-literate, half-literate, miseducated, as Brother Woodson said, they must know that in this thing that we created, you and I created the first library in the world, not them. Right, right. You and I developed science, not them. Right. You and I developed the greatest sophisticated technology on the planet, not them. That's right. But at the same time, if you develop a bank, I come and steal all the money out of it, you still will. The question is not who originated, the question is who controls it in the time in which you live. By 16, I begin to figure out Someone is tricking me. Someone has convinced me of things that's not true. So today they've convinced you if you drop the ER and put an A up there, you're still not a nigga. That it means something different. Got you dancing the songs and shouting the songs that's cussing you out every day. That's right. And white people talked about you like you're black rappers, you'd be mad and want to start a revolution. And you pay for it. And you play it, and you give it to your children, and then act surprised that they're backwards. Every child lives with your family until they're five, so if they can't go to school and read, when they start school, grab that mirror. My son is three. I guarantee you he has the vocabulary of people six or seven. Ask my mother when she talks to him. He'll sit and have a whole conversation with you. If I take recorded what he was saying and transcribe his words, you say, he can't be three. No, he's three. 
But what I do is talk to him in whole sentences. And I consciously and unconsciously develop his vocabulary. And I expose him to a variety of skill sets for his cognitive development right. by design. Because I know when he hits that school system, which by the grace of God he's never hit, yes. what that is going to do. But if he enters the school unprepared, say, Malcolm EU, what didn't y'all do? Because y'all gave birth to him. Before any school could control him, EU and I had. So his development depends upon the man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror, and what we're going to do. Because we have the opportunity to shape him. And we're going to shape him one way or the other, who we leave him with, what we don't expose him to. So he can't give you a cognitive answer, but he wouldn't be shocked if you said Marcus Garvey. He wouldn't be shocked if you said Angela Davis or Malcolm X. I've had family members say, why are you teaching boy, that boy all that stuff? And I reverse and say, why aren't you teaching yours that? He's black. His mother is Ethiopian. We have the responsibility to ensure that he knows about Africa and Ethiopia. But then we were blessed to have him on Nelson Mandela Day. So I can tell you, when he's 12, he's going to be on Robbie Allen, God bless him, I'm alive. He and I, on July 18th, 2030, will say, this is the man you're named after. This is where they imprisoned his body, but they can never take his spirit. And they can never take his mind. And when he came out, he was prepared to run a country because he remained strong, even in the midst of the devilish apartheid system that they constructed. It was just a system that he overcame. He broke those rocks, but they never broke his spirit. This is whose birthday you were born on. This is the person who you shared with. My daughter was born on the day of Muhammad Ali, so we swing in our house. One child on Ali day. Also Michelle Obama day, I should add. One child on Nelson Mandela day. And so my responsibility as their parent, I tell each person, look at your children with two eyes. I see my child as... My child, that's Sam, that's Ayana, but I also see them as my students. I am responsible to educate them. And educating them means sometimes not talking, but bringing them Sister Myers to your house, because she knows some things I don't know. And making sure, Brother Neil, they've seen your art collection, and then I'll leave them with you, and I'll bring them to you, and I'll bring them, because it says Tiny Village, it takes a village to raise a child. Because it takes a village to raise a child, I realize that I cannot get one. Your child gets sick. You take them to the doctor. You don't say, out of love, I'm operating. No. You take them to the people who have the skills that will elevate them or save them. We should be doing the same thing intellectually. We should be going to those of you who know and providing the economic resources to make that possible. Let me read really quick through the next six and then we'll do a Q&A and we'll stop here. And I'm going to make this available after I edit it to the producer of this program. And each of you will have an opportunity if you so with no charge. Each of you have an opportunity to have a copy of it. I wrote it with the intention in mind that you would be able to read it at another time. There's no way in the short time that we'll have. So I'll just briefly go over what those things should be. A Marcus Garvey newsletter. I'll skip the lecture in part and say, here are four quick benefits of having a Marcus Garvey newsletter out of Columbus, Ohio. One, it will teach our community and our youth journalism, technology, and marketing skills. Two, it will connect our city and our community to and with national and international communities we are currently disconnected from. Three, it will allow us to create a historical record of our work and expand and spread Marcus Garvey's message. It will allow us to rethink and reevaluate our own mistakes, policies, plans, and programs. Number four, will help develop much needed creative, critical, and community-based literacy and literary activities, especially from a Pan-African perspective. One of the untold stories of the great Harlem Renaissance was Marcus Garvey's impact on the ideas, ideology, and pro-black dynamics of many of the great writers and artists of that important literary and political development. This, in turn, laid the foundation for the great careers of Paul Robeson, Duke Ellington, and Lorraine Hansberry, and others in their cultural and political work, which helped usher in the civil rights and black power movements of the 50s to the 70s. It goes on, but in the interest of time, I'll skip over that. Number three, a Marcus Garvey speaking project and contest. Garvey led by writing and speaking. Like him or not, Donald Trump spoke his way to the White House, as did Obama and Clinton and Ronald Reagan. George Bush stole office, proof that you can get to 1600 Penn Avenue through many avenues. Garvey was a master rhetorician. Garvey knew how to manage, make, and manipulate language to convey ideas, energy, meaning, reality, create non-existing realities, shape ideology, and promote his cause by the spoken word. 
And then that, again, that continues a long way. So I'll move to number four. Four, the creation of the Marcus Garvey Project Committee. This group would do the actual day-to-day -day work on the ideas outlined in this lecture and beyond. The Marcus Garvey Project would be incorporated as a nonprofit 501c3 organization with all the responsibilities and the rights inherent in the creation of such a legal entity. Number five, the Marcus Garvey Study Group. I will read this one in its entirety. The Marcus Garvey Study Group will be created to ensure that we know what the hell we're talking about when we speak in Marcus Garvey's name <laughs> on his program and his ideas. If one looks at the treatment of Martin Luther King by the black community that claims to love him, our disgraceful ignorance on King's actual words and his work must not be replicated with Marcus Garvey. The Marcus Garvey study group would first themselves study the unique and past socio-historical context of Garvey's leadership. For example, you cannot understand Marcus Garvey and what shaped him and know nothing about World War I, know nothing about the Balfour Declaration and what created and laid the foundation for the creation of Israel, know nothing about the breaking up of the Ottoman Empire and how this led to pan-Arabism, to know nothing about the evolution and development of pan-Africanism in relation to Gandhi's elevation and development, etc. Garvey, like us, came out of a context. And he can't be separated from the nationalism that was taking place in Germany. From 16, 1916 to 1922 was the Irish National Revolution that led to their independence. Garvey studied that. Attempted to go actually review it, but he was unable to because of the Civil War. So, Civil War in Ireland. So to try to understand Garvey, it would be the equivalent of trying to understand Fred Douglas and you never heard of Abraham Lincoln. These things act in symbiotic relationship and we, what I'm arguing for is that we need a group who will do that socio-historical context. When Garvey was 13 years of age, the first Pan-African Conference, con Congress in London began. And so what Garveyism does is he changes and shapes the direction of those. So by the fifth one, which Dr. John Henry Clark has an excellent essay on that I have here from 1945, Garvey's ideas, you can see the evolution and development of Garveyism, how it creates the 1945 Pan-African Conference that does not exist in 1900, even though some of the same players are there, well, actually just two of the same players. So my point is that a Garvey study group would understand that after two years, the Garvey group would develop and make market classes in the, in the Columbus community on Marcus Garvey, market them to children's organizations. They'll produce books and CDs, et cetera, to sell. It's imperative that we know Again, about Marcus Garvey to educators, others on the life of him. For example, there's a Marcus Garvey school in Los Angeles. And based on everything I've read about it, it's a very dynamic school. It's a private school with over 350 students that has received some of the highest academic awards <coughs> in the country. Well, we now have the technology that allows us to have a discussion on a Saturday morning. Our kids in this room and all those kids in Los Angeles. It's not 1940. It's 2017, and we can Skype and FaceTime and all this other stuff to talk to each other. We can have our children. So we can have right now in this room on this screen children in Africa, children in Jamaica, children in L.A., children in Columbus, having conversations with each other about Marcus Garvey, all through the pressing of buttons. So if we're not doing that, grab that mirror, because that means that we are not taking advantage of the creative opportunities of what's going on. Let me tell you a brief story. There was a tragedy um, of a young man who killed a young woman in Youngstown three weeks ago. Then he panicked and put her in her, her dead body in his trunk. Drove her to Buffalo, New York, and was about to cross the state line to Canada. Thought better of it, got on the phone and called his brother and told him what he did. The police were at his car in four minutes. Everything you say is being recorded. Mm -hmm. The operator heard him say, I got a body in my trunk. I just killed such and such. They called the police in Buffalo. Alerted the people in Niagara Falls in case he tried to get across. And then they came up to approach him and pretend like they were going to give him a ticket so he would have no violent response. And then arrested him and took him back to Columbus, I mean, back to Youngstown. Because of one thing he said on the phone. So my point is, the work we're doing is going to be monitored. That's right. It is That's right. what it is. That's right. But what they should know 
is the monitors can be monitored. That's right. Ask the Russians. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So we now talk about a revolution. We got to talk about just putting people in front of a computer and teaching them the same skills that the CIA gives them. All that they do can be done to them. Here at Tubman, we walked out the back door so we could walk through the front door. There is no reason to whisper anymore. There's nothing to be scared of anymore. They're not the only ones with guns. They're not the only ones with computers. Whatever they have, you can sit at this computer and shut down the state of Montana. Mm -hmm. It's a new day and age. The way they rode up on Mark Clark and how they killed those young people in the Black Panthers of 69, them days are done. If they're not done, it means that we have not advanced our cause to the level in which we should. That's right. That's right. That's so we do our work through mm -hmm. Skype. But we keep in mind the fact that we have not created a Skype means we're dependent upon their technology to talk. So part of a Marcus Garvey entrepreneur project is to say, why don't we have an African-American Skype? Some of you remember the uh, uh, website it used to be called, we used to have an email called Black Voices back in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. We now don't even have an email. I'm forced to say Gmail or iCloud or something else they have created which means every communication I spend is immediately monitored by them. That's right. Yeah. So if we're serious about change, the change has to begin with us. We should just, well, let me go to number six and close this down. Uh, Marcus Garvey Youth Committee, which in 2018 will organize and host Marcus Garvey's Arts Festival, with a deep emphasis, mountain speaking, on music and a great priority on drum. The next year they will organize a host and host a Marcus Garvey National Youth leadership conference with guidance from the elders and invite African youth from all over the country and all over the state, etc. Lastly, number seven, the Pan-African Business League and Network. On Cleveland Avenue, all of you have seen it. Some of us pretend like we don't see it because we're embarrassed about it. But the Somali community, That's right. in the country 30 years and less, of a business establishment. Check it. I just finished a year of principal in all Somali K-12 school. We were doing a fundraiser. So we spent all this time organizing this fundraiser with the half-price book. We sat there and sold the book the way I'm selling my book, and we made about $100 in four hours. So the kids called me and said, Mr. Cash, stop that. I said, what are you talking about? I said, listen, forget this. Let me show you what we're going to do next week. So this time we didn't make no flyers. We got together and made the cookies. And they went to the Somali businesses. Uh -huh. I walked in. I heard that. And had twelve hundred dollars in three hours. Mm -hmm. I heard that. Twelve hundred dollars, three hours. A student of mine from Ohio State, Yofi Mesman. He works for a gentleman who's been in America for twelve years. He has a parking company with 224 employees. He came in, and he was a taxi driver, and he's driving all these people around. And he said, well, good Lord, I got to park my car somewhere. There's a parking lot. How, how about if I put together an Ethiopian community and we contract to park cars? Now he has a parking service. He was invited to the White House. He just bought his mother, and I sat in the restaurant myself, a new restaurant for their anniversary. Paid five hundred thousand dollars for the restaurant in cash in five years. We, who are Africans and have been in America three or four hundred years, we spend our lives protesting. They spend their lives developing businesses. Any group of people who are broke economically, it doesn't matter. What else you have? I want to read this one, typo or no typo, and I'll close with that because I want you to see uh, number seven. So sadly, we live in a capitalist mercantile society. This translates into a country. So it says county, it should says country. Made of life and a, and a mode of life and a way of thinking about being human that everything and every one is for sale. I have a principal, I'm not going to pay a family member to babysit my child. Period. And you're not going to pay me to watch my own relative. Period. 
You got to pay me to watch my flesh and blood. It's over. It's done. I don't know you, and I brought them to your house. I live in America. I don't want to pay you, truth be told. But I know you're not going to do it without it because you've been Americanized. Mm -hmm. Same house with a three year old running around that you in anyway, but you're going to ask me for $20. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. Yeah, they cracked you in the jaw and they got you. So I'm going to offer it to you. I hope you turn me down. But you're not going to pay me to watch your child. Because I'm going to be in that house whether your child's there or not. And I'm going to do the same things I'm going to do and not. So if I got the time and the spirit and the ability to watch your child, drop them at Malcolm Cash's house and go do what you have to do, and then you pick them up. Use that gas and buy them something. Bring them a book or something. Everything cannot be based on money. And what it is, the capitalists have gotten it. Let me be clear and unequivocal. I'm anti-capitalist. I believe it is the lowest form of human economic development on the planet, no matter how pretty your building may be. Because first of all, all the pretty things you see is based upon thievery and robbery and murders and lies and war. It's not as if they're developed out of something. When you're driving on those tires, do you know the price that the Africans paid to get that rubber here? So you may have. Black people pretend like we want to be free. Keep in mind that you live in a country that is 6% of the world's population and uses 30% of the world's resources. So if you really want justice, talk about you now, and you only had 6% of the world's resources, you wouldn't be living like you're living. That's right. Period. If those resources were economically, excuse me, equitably divided of all of God's children, not just those in the USA, we claim to be against war, but war is the very source of why gas is only $2. Mm -hmm. So we like that $2 gas while we claim we don't like that war overseas. So if Africans in America want to live better as free people, it means that we have to abandon the economic model that has made us unfree. That's right. And create economic infrastructure worthy of that group called the human race. In the country in which I live, and you live, if a person died from starvation, we will blame it on them and all the animals at the zoo are fed. Mm -hmm. And if they refuse to feed one animal, they would be accused of criminal neglect for not feeding a giraffe while human beings are intentionally left without health care. Intentionally, remember, King died asking for a mandatory minimum wage. And black people pretend to want to follow King. But do you want to go to jail? Do you really want to be away from your children like King was away from his children? We ever haven't seen King as a leader. We don't think about it. He was a father. Amen. He was a husband. The day he was killed, a four-year-old girl was left without a father. A 12-year-old boy, an 11-year-old boy, and an 8-year-old boy never would see their father again. And he knew he was risking his life every time he opened his mouth. And yet he did it. We have tenured faculty who won't speak up for their people. The whole purpose of tenure, as flawed and criminal as that system is, is to give you the free speech and they won't open their mouths. We have preachers and teachers. And believe me, I had my first teaching job. I spoke the way I'm speaking. I was relieved of my teaching job. As I told them, I was eating before that teaching job. I'll be eating after that teaching job. If Harriet Tubman could lead 19 military exercises at what we call the Underground Railroad for the freedom of her people risking her life, I am going to speak at every venue and every opportunity. FDR said it as well as I've heard it said. You have nothing to fear, 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 but fear itself. And when you relieve yourself of that fear, you are free. Now you may be broken free, <laughs> but you're free. You may not have a lot of friends. You may be targeted. You may be called names, but you will be free. Because you're not free, even the most unfree man in America is at 1600 Penn Avenue. Because this whole program is based on lies and manipulation and self-destruction and now unfortunately communal destruction. And when that becomes the foundation of your agenda, no title, president, and no amount of money, which is just ultimately a sheet of paper. You have to remember that money is just, it's not even real. It's just a sheet of paper. 
If you don't believe it's just a sheet of paper, let me give you a, a Russian $100 bill. You go try to buy a newspaper and Columbus and see how that works out. They're going to tell you, but in a Russian, you say, well, you're not a Russian. Take that sheet of paper and throw it in the garbage. And keep in mind that the United States became the military and economic power it is, is because of something we rarely talk about in our community, was called the Brenton Woods Conference. And it was that conference in New Jersey, excuse me, in New Hampshire, that set the new economic order that laid the foundation of the dollar as being the world currency. And as China's smart to do and Russia's smart to do, once that currency ends, That's it. it's going to be just like the gold of Wizard of Oz, worthy of nothing. Just gold that glitters, but has no reality to it. So again, we are buttressed up, even though we're at the bottom of the barrel in this nation state. And what Marcus Garvey was attempting to do was to talk about a new political, and economic, and social order. The brother back there said earlier that Garvey was in prison. This is true. Garvey was deported. This is true. Keep in mind, he was deported in 27. He didn't die until 40. 13 years, black people in America betrayed him. That's right. Black people in Jamaica betrayed him. That's right. Garvey did not die some broken down man. Garvey was assassinated through attrition in the same way Paul Robeson was. Some they shoot with bullets, the Malcolm and Martins. Others they try to shoot through, just by framing them up, the Angela Davises. Some others they shoot through the neglect of their work. And so we are given Ralph Ellison, but not John Killings. Mm. So they determine who you will be exposed to. We are not given sometimes the best, even of our theological traditions, like the Howard Thurmans of the world and Sister Barbara Harris. And so what we have an opportunity to do, how can we justify living in a country, living in a city, with over 70 libraries and we have children who can't read? How do you justify that? Right. You added all of the libraries just at Ohio State, Capitol, Audubon, by the way, which is accessible to everybody in this room, all of the public libraries. How can we justify? I challenge you to go to the Toronto Library and walk in and guess what you're going to see? The library has partnered with the university. The university has partnered with the African American organizations there and they're doing literacy programs for their youth in the library. They've set up studios in their library. You walk into Scarborough Library and it was called the Public Library. That's what the building is saying. So you get there and you walk in, what do you see? In the library, as one entity, well, there's a swimming pool, there's a senior citizen's room, there's a youth room, there's an ice skating ring, here's the traditional public library, there's a speaking element, and you call yourselves the most creative people. America, while creative and technology, is the most underdeveloped group on the planet when it comes to human relations. You can get to the Mars, but won't talk to your neighbor. What a people. You're talking about, not you and I, but they're talking about colonizing Mars. They can't have a peaceful march in Virginia. So it strikes me if we follow that same tradition, we're going to be led down the same path that they have. Let me stop right there. I apologize for the length of this, and thank you, and God bless you. Uh, I'm going to be doing an ACT, the applications are over there, I'm going to be doing an ACT training twice a month, beginning next month. I'm working with students from the 8th grade to the 12th grade. Parents, if you enroll your children in the program, I'm going to work with them very hard. If you're not going to enforce the work that I give them, don't bring them. Simple as that. I'm going to do academically what, the, what you demand that the coach does For athletically. Word, word. So if you don't, if they're not going to enforce, they're working hard. They're going to complain. They've been socialized in America. So they see reading and writing as a punishment. But the ACT is undergoing a transformation in the economic and the political structure here to where you now can substitute ACT scores mm -hmm. for the state-mandated test. Yeah. They're now mandatory that all schools give them, at least in the state of Ohio, I don't know about nationally, but in the state of Ohio, they're now mandatory beginning in 11th grade. Scholarships are tied. I tell students, I tell parents all the time, grades get you in college, ACT scores, SAT scores get you money for college. Word, word. Without the good grade, you don't get in. Poor ACT scores, you don't get any money. And now you have to loan it out, and your parents have to loan it out. So it is imperative, not just my program, but any other program, I'm going to take up to 20 students. 
So if the cost is there's eight of them, it's $300 for all eight sessions, or you can go $50 a session. We'll be meeting twice a month. My information is over there. Uh, I was at the Ohio State University. I'm now teaching at Wittenberg University in their English department. Uh, so we're going to be doing the workshops. I want to announce that, by the way, there is a Marcus Garvey School that meets three times a week, two to five. It's only $25 a month, excuse me, from three to six. It is run by Mr. Diallo Morgan, who had to be, it was out of the country right now, so he wasn't able to be here to introduce me and do some other things. So I just want to promote that program. It's only $25 a month. He and I have worked together for the past three years, starting at Brother Neil's place. I do eighth through twelfth grade. He does K through seventh grade. So we're in the same building. I'm in one room. This year, I'm focusing on reading, writing. I have a, a sister who works with me, Ms. Kathia, on the chemistry and the math and the science. I don't have that skill set, but I do the reading and the writing. And so we meet twice a month from 2.30 to 5.30, 8th grade through 12th grade. I work with them. A young man who's sitting at the table is one of my students. Uh, he's been in our program for all three years. And Ritwan, would you stand? Just one of the young people to see you. So this is Ritwan Muhammad. I've been working with him since he was about in 7th grade. <laughs> Beautiful young man. And so Ritwan, you're in the 10th grade this year? And he's at the, what's the name of your school? Metro Institute of Technology? Yes, yeah. Columbus. Yeah, it's right on, um, it's a part of the Franklin University. Yeah. So it's right on Grant Avenue. And so this young man is here. And by the way, we should be teaching our young people. They want them to speak French. French, French. But I see 50,000 Somalis in the city. So it strikes me, I should be teaching them Somali. I should be teaching them in heart. Not just because of African language, but allows you to do commerce. And so I want to challenge us to begin to get together. I moved to Columbus. The sole purpose of the high number of African immigrants. If it didn't have African immigrants, I'd still be in Lorraine or somewhere else. I'm going to see African Americans wherever I go because that's who I am. I got 500 in my family. <laughs> I don't need to go to a place to see African Americans. That's who I am. That's what I am. I wanted to be around a group of people who thought differently, who was approaching. And now I remind those groups of people when they start correcting me on all the ills of the black community, the American community, I say, yeah, that's true. I remind them that Somalia has a civil war, and that's why we're here. Word. I remind them that the continent of Africa is ravished by internal dissent. That's right. So do not let the people who are enemies divide us. We are all one people catching hell from the same source. And so it's imperative that be you from the Caribbean island, be you from America, Latin America, Africa, displaced in Europe, wherever you may be from, we are yes. one people. That is the message that strikes me and the thing that is most important about Marcus Garvey. We are one people. Imagine a king would have had that Garvey vision. And instead of, with all due respect to my great leader, instead of trying to put together a poor people's campaign for all the people would have spent those remaining three or four years after the passage of the Voting Rights Act to consolidate the power base of Africans. Africans, we have two choices. If you want to be free in America, at least if you want to have more power in America. You can leave America, left eye, right eye, tell me we're not going to do that. If all Africans in this country lived in five states, the entire country would be different for you. It's called the United States for a reason. The country functions by state power. And by us being diffused over 30 states, it weakens not our voting block only. It weakens our economic and political power base. Keep in mind that the state of Ohio has relationships where it does business by China as an entity called the state of Ohio. And as long as it doesn't violate val 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 uh, federal law, which is not reviewable by Congress, but you don't control, and I don't control a single state in the country. So instead of us taking the time to reevaluate that coastal line of Georgia, the Carolinas, Virginia, and Maryland, and Delaware, every single African in America lived in those five states, you would suddenly have 10 senators and change the whole balance of the most powerful institution in the country, the Senate. You would suddenly have five state representatives, almost all of them being yours. You would suddenly have five governors and you would have an control of national guards, et cetera, et cetera. So if we're not going to leave America, we have to rethink our configuration in America if we want to be a political player and move forward. I, I, I will close with that. Professor, I would like for you to address 
uh, when you and I spoke, we talked about putting together a planning committee to start to look at bringing some of these ideas together so that we could put something in action. Okay. Two things. First, it has been a wonderful honor and joy to be in your city. Uh, I'm leaving your city permanently next August. Where are you going? Um, I'm going out of here, so I'm not sure where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm going out of here. Um, so I want to preface that, but that doesn't matter because um, people work across the whole country regardless. Um, and so it was my recommendation, as I put on one here, is that we can keep celebrating birthdays and having programs and events like this. Words matter, but words must be used. Words are like blood. Without blood, you will not be alive, but if blood has no body to be contained in, then blood dies out. So if blood in a can doesn't sustain life, but a body without blood cannot live. So words are like blood. But the body that will make that blood matter is the actual plans and follow through that we've done. For example, and it's not to promote my program, I must have went to 30 churches in the community. I've done any and everything to publicize my program. In three years of my Saturday programs, I've had a total of six African American students and 60 students from Africa. I'm African American. But the African American students come, they see the work that I'm going to put, they fit and faint and pretend like mm -hmm. I just helped them, and then their parent comes and say, oh, I understand, and that's the end of that. The Somali parents say, I ain't trying to hear that noise. <laughs> what, what time you want me to have it, Mr. Cash? Even that young man been trying to drop my program since he arrived. <laughs> <laughs> His mother said, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> He'll tell you. I just picked him up today. I called her. I said, I need him. She said, what time? I didn't even tell her why. She didn't ask me why after 20 minutes of a call. By the way, what y'all going to be doing? But she knows what the agenda's about. Mm -hmm. So she said, yeah, anytime you meet my son. But she also knows that, as she has done, that she can call me at 10 o'clock at night and say, hey, he's got a big test tomorrow. Homeboy wasn't doing what he needs to do. Can I drop him by your crib? And I said, sure, no problem. Drop him off. And then we work till 11 to 12 o'clock at night. So she knows it's a symbiotic right. relationship right. of where we're not using each other, but symbiotic. supporting each other. Exactly. And so I recommend that we put together a committee of people who have expertise in certain areas in that committee. Keep in mind that what became the U.S. Constitution started as an article of confederation in 1774 and was built on the Albany Plan that Ben Franklin put together in 54. So Franklin puts this plan together real quickly in 54 and it crystallizes and becomes a document 1787. I wish Columbus was named Franklin instead. Franklin is the only so-called founding father I have any respect for because Franklin was the only one who stood on the Constitution, excuse me, the convention floor and said slavery is wrong. And we just fought for principles of liberty and it is wrong, Jefferson, it is wrong, Washington, it is wrong, Madison, to enslave these people and yet call for freedom for white folks. So Ben Franklin, I can give a little love to. But Franklin put together a plan that evolved into what became the U.S. Constitution. It took 34 years. So what I'm saying to you is that Nelson Mandela joined the ANC and the African Youth League put together a plan. Nelson Mandela became president 50 years later. Literally, 44 he joined, 94 he became president. So our committee needs to think long term. It takes four years for college. Why don't we just graduate in a semester? How about a year? These things take time. But you also have to start. You can't graduate from college until you pass the first class. Can't come in past the 30 classes, you have to pass the one. The committee, I think, should have representation, obviously inclusive of, of male and female, driven by our agenda, where we're not talking about bathrooms, but we're talking about empowering our people. It should be representative of multi-generations who bring different perspectives and understanding of blackness, and even interpretation of Garvey. Most importantly, it should put together a concrete plan that has you doing something every single month that you can concretely show what you've achieved. My father, bless his soul, said the difference between a dream and a fantasy is a dream always have a date line of completion. The fantasy is the person who says, I want to be a doctor. The dream is the person who says, I'm going to medical school and I'll be out in 2015. Dreams are empowering visions. 
but they have to have some kind of infrastructure, location, and accomplishment dates. Think of what it would be like driving from wherever you're going to go with no stop signs and no red lights. The very act of stopping you brings order so when you start, you can transition smoothly. So if we want to move forward as a community, we have to literally put together a diverse infrastructure that will replicate the best of our community and will be specific to Columbus, Ohio, and then we have to link it. Our other, I was doing some research, particularly in Harlem and LA, there are other people doing some, and Philadelphia, doing some great Garvey kind of programs. We should be selecting one child and one adult from Columbus, one child and one adult from LA, Philadelphia, and such and such, who are then going to travel together to Jamaica, who are going to travel together to Africa. How can we not be learning Chinese and there's a billion of them? Mm -hmm. One billion people, one sixth of the Earth's population is in one country. There are more people in India than on the whole continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. You can put India in Africa three times, but there are more people. What that tells me is Africa has a lot of land. A lot of space. See, Africa has a lot of poor people, but it's the second richest continent on earth. And white folks have been spending centuries telling us how poor Africa is, so we won't think one way of it, so they can go over there and exploit the natural resources of it. Africa is rich, not just in culture. It is estimated by the UN that by the year 2040, that the second richest country on earth of natural resources in the ground, besides Russia, will be the Congo. One of the reasons why the Congo is the most underdeveloped is because it has the most economic potential. So why aren't we having conversations about the Congo? How I want to I want to challenge. I don't want to put the word challenge. I want to invite all the African Americans born and raised in the United States to before this year is over to have Africans to your home to host them for dinner. I went to Ghana. I went to Ethiopia, and I had strangers invite me to their house. Sometimes I went, first of all, there's too many invitations to go. We should be demonstrating the same hospitality right. and exposing our cultures, plural, to them because we know what they're told prior to coming here. And those sisters just cussing out white folks because they see half of it's true with their own left eye and right eye when they get here. But there's another part of our culture. Marcus Garvey in this lecture, I mean, this book behind us, he said only African Americans could have produced a Fred Douglas and produce a, a Booker T. Washington. Because we are in many ways the most progressive people mm -hmm. on the planet ideologically. Right. But here's the challenge. You can't eat ideology, <laughs> and ideology doesn't control land. Mm. Right. So you need both, not either or. A group of backwards people with land won't produce movement forward. Mm -hmm. But the people who have great ideas, and they don't have any land, they won't move forward either. We need each other, mother and father. Our culture now is telling us you can have two men run the household, two women run the household. I won't get into that argument. I happen to disagree with it. But in the model I'm operating from, you need both of them to come together. They both came together to produce the child. And then they both come together to flower and evolve and develop the child. Well, we need the same thing. We need ideas and action. You and I are forced to live under a constitution that emerged out of the ideas and the ideology of a core group of European American males, mainly who were wealthy and slave owners. And you can cuss out the Constitution, but you're going to follow it. And they don't personally care how you feel about it emotionally, as long as you follow it. So what we have to do is to come up with our own internal. And the example we gave of the self, excuse me, the, the, the cable stations know that we can funding. We don't have to beg and ask anyone to fund anything for us, but we should be asking ourselves, where is the economic business infrastructure of African Americans that look like the Somali one on Cleveland Street? And if we don't have one, there's no sense in lamenting it, just change it. There's no sense in saying we should change it. I had a 0.50 when I went to college. I said, I'm going to change it. I simply changed it. So I came out with a 3.98. I had the same intelligence in high school as in college. I didn't have the same focus, the same dedication, the same action plan. And by the way, the Upper Bound program, I need to only give love to it, that was the program that I enrolled in and had a great mentor. And he became my bridge. His name is Mr. Lawrence Barker. God bless his soul. He just passed um, in, in January of this year, 90 years of age. When I was in high school, I took a note. When no one was looking, I put it, Brother Neil, on my locker. 
The note simply said, niggas are no good. I went to class. I came back to my locker, and there were all kind of people around my locker. The principal would come and take down the note, and they were threatening to fight, and this and that. And I went, Sister Myers, and opened my locker and pretended like I didn't know about the note. They said, Cash, that, that's your locker? I said, yeah, well, what's up? Oh, man, don't worry, worry, we got your back. I said, what are you talking about? Man, there was a note here saying, nigga, I'm no good. I said, oh, yeah, I put that note up. <laughs> because if you don't think you're a nigger, you ain't mad to know. <laughs> See, I don't think I'm a nigger, so I can agree with you. Niggas are no good. Hey, Trump. Hey, Bush. I'm not what they call me, so I don't care about the name. When white people call me nigger, I keep walking. If a black person calls me nigger, I turn around and say, no, no, no. That's right. Because you're my brother. That's right. And you're my sister. That's right. So I care if you're wayward. I don't expect them to label me. When they call me brother, they still stab me in the back. So what do I care what name they're calling me? Them embracing me by language, they'll embrace my agenda. And when they embrace my agenda, I gotta act like Clarence Thomas. Which is meaning I'm just embracing their agenda. So I'm not concerned. And I, and I make these broad strokes about white Americans. And I apologize because I don't mean all of them. I'm talking about the larger rubric of the country. So I'm not concerned about what they say. No. I do know this. I've done it before. I printed off the lyrics of what you call rap music. I give those to parents and say, read them out loud. What you let your children dance to. How about I give it to a white teacher and see what you say? I would love for white teachers to print off the lyrics of our rappers and read them off in class and watch black people get mad and say, oh no, that's just you talking. If you denigrate yourself, that's right. There you go. Based on the term, has anybody greeted, greeted their grandmother lately? Hello, my bitch, how you doing? Right. Any greetings like that? No, you know the word is not redeemable. Mm -hmm. Nor is the so-called N-word redeemable. No matter how many ERs you drop and A's you try to slip in there and threaten and claim that you're being creative and you mean it differently. No, the word was created to meant you're not fit to walk the face of the earth. It still means that you're not fit to walk the face of the earth. And there's a reason that those people who promote that kind of rap is promoted in our community. Because there are other rappers. There are other creative artists. And I don't mean just the last poets. I don't know them. Lock and step. I need my brother O Sharp. But if he was here, I say hit it, oh, and then he would give you a long list of rappers who are elevating our people who won't receive an Emmy or excuse me, a Grammy or be exposed because you might be liberated intellectually when you engage the creative form that is rap as opposed to the commercialization of what became rap. Any other last questions that we'll close? Yes, ma'am. Um, I worked a lot with the Somalian community and I went to a lot of, I went to a lot of the mosques and I went to a lot of the mosques good election. And the one thing that I found about the Somalians, you know, when they had that midday mosque, there are thousands of people there at one time. And they only have one religion. Now we have divided up into so many mm -hmm. <laughs> religions that we can't come together. Thank you. And 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 this I found is a dilemma. And, I, and another thing that happens, I went to so many communities, I didn't know there were that many in Columbus. The Europeans are making millions and millions of dollars off of all the housing. Oh, yes. Yeah. The housing. So they feel, you know, they have to let them do something because hey, they're making all these. I went to communities that were thousands of apartments, nothing but small. Mm -hmm. and, and there's always a white person in the middle of that community that kind of maintained them. And, and I really got to be exposed to them. They're successful. But have you been to that mall on Morris Road lately? Mm -hmm. It's not good. Where are they? I went there the other day. They were, half of the stores were closed. And the Somalians are angry there because they were very pompous before. And I walk in there and they act like I was dirt under their feet. And whenever they come up to me and I say, look, you have a mall because us as black people weren't allowed to have stores. You want to get us lynched? Try to have a store in South Carolina where I'm from. Mm -hmm. You will be lynched. So we are in our condition because we have, in order to live, we, we say, well, maybe we just be happy being consumers. We don't want to be, but do. 
due to the constant conditioning. The Samaritans are not conditioned. They came up with money, acting, and walking like that, and speaking their language. We couldn't even do those things. And I'm sorry to say, I think you are right. We need to do it, but we need to change our situation mentally. Mentally. And our religion has so much to do with the disconvention. It, it really messes us up to an extent. I agree. I, I, I let that statement stand. I don't need to elaborate on that. We're all spoken. Any other comments or questions? No. No. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna need to get okay. to our uh, okay, closing so, circle. So we're gonna close right there. Thank you. God bless. And let's give another hand for. Uh, Today at 5 o'clock at the Ohio History Center and tomorrow at 3 p.m. And they're as much as possible. Let's see if we can do male, female. And uh, they're trying to raise money for a Rashawn Roland Kirk um, scholarship. Will the men move? I go. I go. I may. Um, if we could have male, female. As much as possible. We can. And lastly, uh, Elder Phyllis, had you completed your announcement? Yes. I'm coming. That's all right. We're 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 <laughs> Are we and then I put the kids in the Who is the eldest member with us here today? That's going to be like pulling teeth, bro. No, it's not. I may be happy to be older. Who's 80? She's 81. Oh, okay. I'm 81. Uh -oh. Anybody older, older than 81? So, 81 going once, <laughs> twice, That's it. and uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's Mother Cash then? Yes, sir. Mother Cash is an honor. Um, again, your son and I attended Oberlin together, and um, you know, it's, it's always good to know the father from which one comes. And so, with that, I ask your permission. May I continue? Yes. Thank you. Wow, family. Uh, it's been an awesome day. For several reasons. we get to learn how we might apply what the most honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey was teaching us you know my, my heart is it's full and, and uh, with ambivalent feelings because man you know uh, brother Malcolm reminded us the pain that the Most Honorable Marcus Mosiah felt because in many ways he was rejected by us. 
He was Jamaica. He was uh, rejected at home in Jamaica. That's right. Yeah. But he told us to look for him. And I right. said, so let's look for him yes. and honor him for what he said and where he said he'll be, and use that energy and use that force to go forward and do what Malcolm said. Thank you for that, mother. And uh, with that, we say our share. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. Thank you. 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 Thank you.